Okay, now it's okay. You can continue. Okay then. Uh, so I mean, uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, uh, wood protection. Uh, I'm not going uh, to discuss everything in detail because it's a vast subject. Uh, but uh, I think I'll, I'll have some time to introduce these things to you, and then you can start studying on these things uh, by your own. So that's my objective. Uh, I think I'm talking to uh, undergraduates. Uh, so basically, I mean, as I told you earlier, I like to uh, talk about this wood protection to engineers because uh, in local industry especially, uh, there are no uh, sufficient knowledge base uh, within the engineers on wood protection because I mean we are more knowledgeable on uh, concrete and all steel everything we know but uh, when it goes to wood and wood coatings uh, I mean we let it to the architect I mean architect also always uh, looks on the appearance and all the architectural features but I mean when we discuss we'll understand that engineers also have a role especially I mean I think you are from materials department so I mean uh, as materials engineers, uh, so you have a, I mean, a significant role in uh, wood coatings also in actually wood protection. So, I mean, uh, let's move on. So, uh, I mean, to, in today's discussion, I'm, I'm uh, uh, planning to talk about wood protection, the definition of it, and then what are the wood degradation factors. Uh, then a uh, few engineering codes, EN codes, which are applicable, which are relevant to uh, the uh, wood protection. And then uh, some available solutions uh, in the industry, uh, especially at site. And then about some uh, few common myths in the industry. So this is what I'm going to talk about uh, wood protection today. So let's move on. So, I mean, when I mean, before talking about uh, wood protection, wood as a material, actually, I mean, many evidences shows that uh, for thousands of years, we are using wood as a construction material. Uh, it has a long history, I mean, other than concrete or PVC, or PVC plastics, compared to any other alternative, uh, wood has a long, long history. Uh, I mean, we use it in furniture, we use it in building construction, uh, we use it in uh, building boards, ships and all. So in many applications, we use wood. Especially man prefers uh, wood because we, we prefer nature. I mean, even at your house, you like to have uh, wooden uh, doors and windows, I mean, wooden floor, wooden furniture. Even if we can't use wood, we use an alternative with the appearance of wood. That's because uh, humans, uh, like uh, nature and so the wood. So, I mean, the, the, the main pro problem is the durability. I mean, on the other hand, some talks about that deforestation and all when we use the wood, but I don't think uh, that's a concern because uh, it is a concern about, about supply and demand. Uh, so if we have a plan to supply for the demand or we, if we can manage the demand, uh, then uh, wood is a very good renewable material uh, eco-friendly material compared to all other alternatives. So, but the main drawback is the less durability. You know, wood will degrade very easily uh, in a short time if you don't treat it properly. Right. So, uh, then the engineer's contribution required here to increase the durability of wood. So, that is our main uh, responsibility uh, when we consider wood as a construction material. Uh, so, I mean, uh, when we talk about uh, the durability of wood, uh, we have to know what is wood protection and what is wood paint. Because today I'm talking about the coatings, uh, simply paints, right? So in that case, we have to identify what is wood protection, what is wood paint. Uh, I mean, in that case, both are coatings, both are I mean, uh, light paints. Uh, but when it comes to, a, I mean, paint, when a paint becomes a wood protection, uh, it, it gives more priority to the durability or the protection of the wood, right? Uh, just the paint gives the priority for the aesthetic appearance only. Let's say the color, finish, or maintenance uh, aspects, or I mean, uh, some special uh, appearances like that. Uh, uh, just a paint will talk about the aesthetic appearance. 
but a wood protection we'll talk about how to how to resist with uv uh, how to uh, resist with uh, water or moisture uh, how to resist with uh, biological things uh, insects so fungi algae something like that we talk about the protection uh, gives by the coat so if our focus is on the protection then we call it as a wood protection right but anyway i mean when we looking at the product both are similar as a paint uh, then uh, if a wood protection brand they always uh, employ the r and d uh, for the developing of the uh, durability of the i mean uh, the wood right the technology develops towards the wood protection right uh, but if it is just a paint they uh, develop the technology towards the aesthetic appearance to maintain new finishes like that. so that is the difference between just a wood paint and a wood protection so our focus engineers focus should be on wood protection uh, i mean the aesthetic appearance will take care of uh, take care by the architects right they will select the color they will select the finish uh, all the things they will specify in their specifications but as engineers we have to specify uh, the coating which will give the uh, required protection right i mean if, if it is a wooden construction maybe we design it for a, say 25 years or 50 years then we have to specify the coating to protect this wood uh, to maintain the structural stability of that construction uh, i mean uh, we have to specify the protection or the coating or the I mean, protection system in order to maintain that uh, durability so that is the responsibility of engineer so we'll see uh, how uh, we can do this before that we have to understand because we are talking about the wood protection so if so we should understand what are the degradation uh, factors uh, and the risk related so if we know the basic factors then we we can uh, treat those basic factors then we can have uh, the durability we can uh, withstand with this uh, mean the risk right uh, basically we uh, divide uh, these uh, degradation factors into uh, two but here i have shown you three uh the first one is biological attacks the second one is atmospheric impacts these are the common uh, categories which the wood degradation factors are false but uh, i mentioned here as uh, risk in human use because uh, the, the first two factors are the first two categories are uh, i mean uh, not relevant to our use but the common for uh, any application right uh, but uh, we cannot uh, forget this human Uh, activities also because uh, i mean wood construction or a furniture or anything we will use uh, by humans so i mean there may be some uh, interactions with that which will damage the wood so we have to consider that factor those factors also uh, here the first one is biological attacks uh, i think you may have seen that uh, the places where some insects attack to the wood and the, the total uh, wood inside uh damaged by them so the structural strength was uh, i mean not there uh likewise i mean there may be uh, visible or non visible uh, biological attacks uh maybe insects maybe fungi uh, rots uh mold bacteria likewise any living creatures right which attacks to uh wood we we consider this category as biological attacks uh the second category is atmospheric impacts uh humidity uh, water in in a country like us uh uv rays you i mean from the sunlight it is one uh, critical aspect and uh, i mean we are getting rain uh, all over the year so the water and humidity uh, that also a challenge uh, so temperature changes also affects the wood but in sri lanka i mean we don't see such uh, changes but in the night and the day Uh, we have some uh, differences so these factors affects to uh, uh, wood uh, durability uh, so uh, third one is uh, the risk in uh, human use especially i mean as an example if you take a uh, wooden floor we walk on it we move furniture on that so there may be scratches there may be wearing uh, or maybe some chemicals or some liquids may fall on that some uh, 
uh, poor things may fall on that. So these things will damage to the wood. So if we talk about the durability, if we talk about uh, the protection of the wood, we have to treat these degradation factors. We have to identify the factors affecting to the application, then we have to treat. Uh, so for this, we need a proper engineering methodology uh, to identify the uh, factors and then the solution. So we'll see how it is happening in the industry. Uh, so there are many uh, uh, EN codes. So normally we refer to EN codes now. Uh, so we have several engineering for EN codes uh, uh, relevant to this, but uh, today I'm talking about uh, just three. I mentioned here uh, five codes, but uh, I'll just uh, uh, discuss uh, little in detail uh, for three codes. Uh, there are several other things, but uh, relevant to coatings. Because today I'm talking about uh, the wood protection coatings. So, uh, relevant to the, the wood coatings, uh, I will discuss uh, three EN codes in brief. Uh, the first one is EN335. I mean, EN335 defines use classes. Uh, I mean, uh, you will agree with me uh, that according to the use of the wood, let's say if it is a furniture, so we can keep it inside our house. We can keep it uh, on a veranda. We can keep it uh, in the garden, right? Then the risk of uh, degradation will not, this, will not be the same. Uh, so in EN 335, it defines, it classifies uh, the use classes uh, according to the risk of degradation, right? We will discuss in detail. Then EN 350, uh, this talks about natural durability of solid. You know, I mean, any any wood has a natural durability. We tested uh, uh, a testing called a graveyard test. Uh, so if you uh, if you have a time, you can talk to the timber corporation Sri Lanka. They do these things. Uh, so it's a loan. Loan. Uh, I mean, it takes long time because I mean, for some wood to uh, degrade naturally, it will take. Uh, 10 to 15 years sometimes. So we have to wait and see how long it will take. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about these testings. You can study, I mean, uh, by your own. But anyway, any wood space we have a natural uh, durability. Right? Uh, I mean, it is important for us because if it is a very uh, durable one, then the, the, uh, the treatment should be a different one. If it is a less durable one, we have to treat it more carefully. Uh, so we have to understand uh, each wood space which we are using in the site, uh, which, I mean, to, I mean, what is the category, what is the natural durability, all these things. Uh, so in EN 350, uh, they have specified uh, several wood spaces and uh, talks about the natural durability and all, but uh, only very few applicable in the local industry because they talk about uh, most of uh, the wood spaces used in uh, Europe. But anyway, I mean, uh, in the local industry, uh, I'm using a book called uh, Sri Lanka with Devashak, uh, written by uh, Dr. Nimal Ruan Patirana. I think he's uh, the general manager of uh, uh, Timber Corporation. Uh, so, he, I mean, he wrote a book with uh, uh, the details of 150 wood spaces. Uh, we use in locally uh, the details about the natural durability and uh, as materials engineers we will need uh, the strength details of uh, wood and everything I mean total details uh, he has included in this book uh, I can show you it uh, I think you can see this thing uh, so it's a good uh, literature uh, as a material engineer if you are interested in wood Right, uh, so I don't uh, uh, discuss this uh, EN 350 in detail here in this presentation because uh, I mean you can study it uh, by your own uh, and also it's, it includes uh, more information not relevant to us. And uh, then the EN 351, uh, preservative treated solid wood. So that also you can refer by your own. If you need, I can share the codes with you. Uh, so, the one other main important, most relevant code is EN927. We will discuss this code here today. Uh, it, it is uh, about paints and varnishes. 
coat in materials and coat in systems for exterior wood. So here, I mean, why this year 927 is important is, uh, I mean, you will understand when we are discussing about use classes, the exterior wooden applications are the most critical, uh, uh, most risky applications in wood. So that's why this year 927 is very important. Then uh, we will uh, discuss about EN 7713. This is about safety of toys. Uh, so let's see, you will understand why, why I am talking about this also. Right. Uh, so we'll move on to uh, EN 335. Uh, I can uh, show you the code first. I think you cannot see my. I think uh, now you can see my screen. Uh, this is the code. Uh, we are going to discuss now EN335. This is about durability of food and wood-based products use classes, right? Uh, so we'll see what it includes. Uh, mainly uh, in this code, uh, it talks about uh, five use classes. Use classes means, uh, I mean, according to the use, according to the location of uh, the uh, wooden application, uh, it uh, classifies uh, these classes in, uh, into five classes, right? Uh, the first one is use class one, uh, situations in which the wood or wood-based product is inside the construction, not exposed to the weather and wetting. As an example, a furniture, uh, in your living room or uh, in your bedroom. So it will consider in use class one because there's no uh, uh, UV attack, no water, uh, no very less moisture. So it is inside. So the degree, degradation risk is very less. Uh, just maybe some uh, biological attacks, very less biological attacks can happen. But uh, there's uh, no atmospheric impacts will affect in this use class one. So very less risk in uh, wood degradation, right? So we'll move on to the second one. Second one is uh, situations in which the wood or wood-based product is under cover and not exposed to the weather, right? The first one is uh, inside, the, inside the house or in the, inside the building. Here it says under cover, not exposed to the weather, but where occasional but not persistent wetting can occur. Let's take example uh, like a bathroom cabinet. So it will not expose to the weather. It will not expose to sunlight. It will not expose to uh, rain, nothing, right? But uh, moisture or just wetting can occur uh, occasionally, right? Uh, maybe a pantry cupboard also we can take into this category. So it, it is use class two. Uh, in this case also, just due to moisture, there may be some degradation risk. Uh, the biological attacks also uh, just little higher than the use class one because of this wetting and all especially. Uh, so uh, this is the uh, use class two. So we'll move on. Uh, the third one is use class three. They divide it into two subclasses also. The use class three explains about situations in which the wood or wood-based product is above ground and exposed to the weather. This is one of critical uh, class uh, we have to uh, uh, give solutions. Uh, it divides into uh, two classes. Subclass one, 3.1 is uh, not remain wet for long. Subclass 3.2, remain wait for long periods, right? Uh, here actually, as an example for 3.1, we can take, uh, uh, if there's a rooftop, uh, uh, garden or rooftop restaurant, you have furniture there. So 
uh, these furniture will come into uh, subclass 3.1 because uh, it exposed to the weather, it exposed to sunlight, it's, it exposed to rain and all. But uh, water will not clog for a long time on a furniture, right? It will, I mean, there will be no clogging. Uh, or, I mean, if we take uh, exterior window, exterior door, all falls in this subclass 3.1. Subclass 3.2 remain wet for long periods. Let's see, I mean, if, if it is a wooden deck or something, uh, I mean, which water droplets can clog for long period. Or sometimes uh, uh, water may retain, I mean, uh, especially a horizontal uh, surface. So this will come uh, into subclass 3.2. So the difference is in 3.1, both, actually both are exposed to the weather and above the ground. So it is not uh, connected with the natural soil. It is above the ground, maybe on a concrete slab, maybe on a decking or maybe on a rooftop. Anywhere, not uh, connected to the earth, but uh, exposed to weather. So, I mean, uh, the, I mean it divides into uh, two subclasses. One will not remain uh, wet for long. The other one remain wet for long periods. So these are the two categories. For uh, 3.1, I have given you examples like uh, uh, furniture in a rooftop, uh, I mean, uh, or uh, uh, windows and doors in exterior space. Uh, I mean, uh, for subclass 3.2, I can give example as a wooden deck, exterior wooden deck, like uh, uh, say it's a pool deck, right? It will come under uh, subclass 3.2. Uh, so we'll move on to the next one. Uh, use class four. Uh, a situation in which the wood or wood based product is in direct contact with ground and or fresh water. Right? This, I mean, uh, this is an example like uh, it's a garden furniture just kept on the soil or uh, any pole uh, uh, constructed on the soil. So, likewise, or I mean, maybe on the ground or maybe on uh, fresh water. Right? You can see some. Uh, uh, deck, so I mean, uh, uh, some constructions in the water uh, by, by using wood. So these things come in uh, use class four. I mean, here the degradation risk is very high. It always contact with uh, Something went wrong. Ajit, can you hear us? Hello, Ajit. Uh, I think some. Yeah, but the shared screen misplaced. Can you share the screen again? Yes, yes. Yes. Now it's okay, huh? Yes, of course. Now it's okay. Okay, okay. I'll continue there. Okay. Uh, so <clears throat> the use class five is uh, uh, in uh, salt water actually. Uh, but I told you, since Sri Lanka, actually, we, we don't get uh, many cases, I mean, uh, in use class five. But in Maldives, uh, as we are working in Maldives also, I see many uh, such cases uh, in Maldives because they have done many constructions in uh, water, uh, salt water, in the sea, actually. Uh, so these are the five classes uh, uh, classified in EN 335. Uh, basically, I want to... Uh, uh, tell you that uh, according to the uh, use, according to the application, or according to the location, this wood is uh, uh, kept. Uh, the risk of degradation varies, right? Uh, from uh, interior furniture uh, to a construction on the soil water, soil water uh, it will uh, it it varies, right? So we have to understand that the I mean in which class our application is there and which kind of uh, risk is there. Uh, so if we identify the, the risk, the, the significant of the risk, then we can 
uh, go for a uh, proper solution. Actually, I mean, uh, even uh, I mean, if you select a good coating, you can ask from the supplier to which use class this coating can be applied. As a, as I mean, uh, not uh, as an uh, engineering specification. If you are preparing engineering specification, you have to we can specify these things. But uh, I mean, if, when you are just purchasing, you can ask from the supplier that uh, the product you are purchasing uh, categorizing which use cost, right? You can ask from them because I mean, from us also, I mean, we can, uh, I mean, if you tell us the use class uh, you are using this product, we can give you the correct product likewise, right? Any, any, any supply, any manufacturer uh, will specify their products according to this use class. Uh, so we'll, Move on. So this is about EN three three five. So do you have any any questions or any anything to clarify further on this thing? Right. If if not, we will move on to EN nine two seven. So this is the most important and most relevant EN code uh, when it comes to exterior wood. Right. I'll show you the code first. Actually, this code uh, includes uh, five parts. The first one is uh, classification and selection. Uh, likewise, they have uh, uh, five parts. Earlier it was six, uh, then later it reduced to par uh, five parts. They uh, removed uh, part four. Uh, so this is, uh, I mean, uh, a very large uh, uh, specification, large uh, EN code. So I'm not going to talk about all these things in these uh, five parts, but I'll uh, explain you a few uh, very important uh, concerns <clears throat> here in this EN927, right? Uh, so first we'll uh, look into EN927 part one. Uh, Actually, part one identifies the criteria that need to be considered when assessing the suitability of a coating system for a particular end use. Uh, actually, uh, I mean, uh, when we are talking about a wood coating, uh, wood protection coating or a paint, uh, there are several performance factors we are expecting. One is protection against uh, aesthetic deterioration, right? Uh, the other one is protection against uh, deterioration due to weathering influences, right? Uh, we, we, we discussed about the degradation factors, so you know, I mean, what are the weather in and out. So, moderation of dimensional change. This is also one uh, main aspect we should consider, but uh, we have neglected the most of the time in, in local industry. Uh, say, I mean, you have a door, right? Uh, with the rain and or with the high humidity, if the door uh, dimensions are changed, I mean, it, if it varies, then you cannot close the door, right? If it is expanding, you cannot close it. If it is shrinking, there may be a gap, right? So uh, in this code, uh, we discuss about these things also. So dimensional change is uh, one of uh, most important thing, but we don't address uh, normally in our local industry. Uh, then protection against uh, blue stain or any other roads and all. Uh, then maintain the function of food components. Likewise, we have uh, the concerns which uh, we should consider when we are selecting uh, wood protection coating. So EN 927 part one identifies the uh, criteria and it defines some, uh, uh, some factors uh, and parameters actually. So we'll see uh, some main concerns are discussed in EN 927 part one, right? Uh, first, uh, it classifies uh, the applications uh, by the intended end use, right? Uh, it classifies uh, it into uh, three categories, actually. First one is non-stable, uh, then semi-stable, and the last one is stable. I'll start from stable because it's easy to explain it. The stable means earlier I told you that uh, if we take a, a door, right, uh, we cannot allow any movement. Right? If it moves, I mean, any movement means any expansion or shrinkage, right? 
If it expands, we cannot close it. If we shrink, there may be a gap, right? So a door is an application where we need the exact dimensions always. Due to any concern, maybe due to temperature, maybe due to a, a humidity or rain, water, we cannot allow any changes. These kind of applications we call as stable. We call, I mean, uh, in general, we call dimensionally stable applications, right? Uh, in the code, it says minimum movement permitted. In sometimes minimum means it's very minimum, right? Uh, the second one is semi-stable. Semi-stable means there may be some applications where we can allow a little uh, movement, right? Uh, little uh, expansion or little shrinkage. Let's say we have a, uh, a ceiling uh, with a turn and go, uh, application, but uh, we have a limited space we have kept for expansion. So there is a uh, very little uh, space we have, which we have allowed uh, to expand and shrink. So if uh, if we have such kind of application, it comes under semi-stable. I mean, uh, we allow a very limited uh, moment. Yeah. Then the third one is non-stable. Actually, I mean, we don't consider any uh, dimensional changes here. Let's take a, a, a wooden fence or we wouldn't pergolas, uh, then uh, we have enough space for these moments. So we don't want to consider any uh, dimensional uh, stability here. So likewise, we have three categories. Uh, I mean, especially uh, this is very important uh, because uh, uh, when we select the coating or protection for dimensionally stable applications, we have to be more careful because if we don't select the proper one, then we have to face such kind of uh, issues in use, right? Then the next one is uh, classification by appearance, right? Uh, first one is build. Build means actually uh, the coating thickness. Uh, it varies from uh, five micrometers to uh, 100 micrometers. Uh, especially when, I mean, earlier we discussed about three categories, no, uh, stable, semi-stable and non-stable. I mean, when it comes from non-stable to uh, stable, normally the build is also becomes high. I mean, we cannot use a, a minimum uh, build one uh, for uh, the, the stable category because coating thickness is also uh, important. So this actually, uh, I mean, uh, a consideration for architects also because uh, it, it affects to the finish. So sometimes they need the with the coating with the minimal build, uh, just I mean like oil or something, just to uh, give the color, but not to have uh, I mean a, a thick coating over the wood, right? That's a concern of architects also. Uh, but for us also, we have to know uh, what is the thickness and all because uh, the coating thickness uh, directly uh, uh, directly uh, affects to the durability of the coating also. Uh, then the uh, second one is hiding power, right? Uh, it, it, it has three categories, okay? Uh, Semi-transparent and transparent. You know, I mean, you, you, you have seen that uh, there are some uh, wood parts coated with uh, uh, coatings like, uh, I mean, uh, say, how can I say? I mean, you cannot see the wood grain, or you cannot see any wood inside. So we just, it is covered like, uh, uh, you know, some uh, kids' furniture or kids' toys uh, made of wood. Uh, they have applied uh, some uh, attractive colors, uh, red or blue, something like that. The wood is all, almost covered. We cannot see any wood there. This kind of coatings we call as opaque. Uh, the, the other one is semi-transparent. We call uh, as uh, translucent coatings also. Because we can see a coat in there, we can see a color, but we can see wood grain also inside. Transparent means actually most of the time clear coatings uh, we have uh, uh, to give the protection, but uh, we cannot see maybe sometimes we cannot see any coating. Uh, just we can see the wood, but there is a coating uh, which gives the protection. Right. So the hiding power categorized like that. Then the gloss level. Uh, this is also uh, uh, I mean relates with the appearance. Uh, uh, I mean, we can have matte coatings, we can have semi-matte, semi-gloss, gloss or high-gloss coatings, depend on the uh, requirement of the architect, right? Uh, these are the 
uh, three classifications by the appearance. Then one main uh, concern, main aspects uh, uh, which engineers should uh, consider is the classification by exposure conditions, right? Uh, it uh, categorizes into two, macroclimatic and microclimatic. Because you know the climate or the atmospheric impacts is one of uh, major category affected to durability. So uh, the compass orientation is uh, one main uh, concern because uh, I mean the UV attacks by the sunlight directly relate with uh, the compass orientation. If our application phase to a waste, then it will have a uh, very risk in degradation, right? I mean, the, I, I, I have taken this uh, diagram here from EN 927, but in sometimes I feel that in Sri Lanka, because we are more, uh, more into, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, not, not, not like Europe, I mean, the, the sun is uh, uh, directly over us. So in that case, uh, sometimes the south is not that much risky as mentioned here in my experience, but I'm not, not going to challenge the court. But in my experience, uh, west and the east are the most significant uh, directions which we have to consider in uh, local industry. Uh, and north is very less and the uh, south is uh, higher than uh, the north. So this is this is the detail uh, provided in EN 927. But anyway, I mean, you have to consider this orientation because let's say our application is in uh, uh, west, phase to west, west, then uh, definitely it will be high risky uh, for degradating by uh, UV attacks, right? Uh, then a degree of shelter also a concern uh, and inclination also. Here inclination, I don't have a, any, any image of course uh, in the code also nothing mentioned there but i will show how inclination affects but shelter degree of shelter i mean you will have seen that some uh, let's say uh, let's take a window uh, some with a canopy like this some with a little canopy some with no canopy so in such a application thus if it is shelter uh, the risk will less if it is no shelter then th there may be a higher risk right uh, then uh, this EN 927 gives a, a formula which we can calculate the degree of risk uh, according to these uh, classifications, right? Uh, so this is important because uh, by calculation of these things, we will come into a conclusion whether this is a mild uh, risky one or a severe risky application, right? Here, <clears throat> I think you can... Uh, see the table here. So the first factor is orientation. Then it is northwest to northeast. If it, if it is northwest to northeast, then it gives one. One is called one. Uh, then uh, if it is northeast to southeast and west, northwest to uh, north, uh, then uh, it is two. Then three. Likewise, uh, according to the direction, we will give a uh, mark. Right? Then degree of shelter. If it is sheltered, it is one. Partly sheltered, two. Uh, then if it is not sheltered, three. Likewise, we have to give a, uh, a score there. Then according to the in inclination, if it is vertical, one. If it is uh, uh, 45 degrees angle, then two. If it is horizontal, three. So let's take some examples. So window with no canopy uh, face to the west, right? Then uh, orientation is west. We have to give three score. Uh, then uh, degree of shelter is with no canopy. Then it is again three. Inclination is uh, vertical. Then it is one. Then the total score is three. Three plus three plus one is seven. Then it is a severe, severe risky application. So we have to if, uh, uh, window face to west with no canopy means uh, we have to treat it with more careful. Uh, then uh, window with uh, no canopy uh, face to the north, then orientation will get one mark. Uh, degree of shelter with, with uh, it will get three marks and inclination one. Then it is with uh, medium risky one. So then uh, let's consider pool deck exposed to the west. Then orientation is three. Uh, then degree of shelter, there's no shelter normally uh, for pool deck. So we have to give uh, three 
then inclination is horizontal, then uh, three marks altogether nine. So that means it's a very severe uh, application, very severe risky application. So we have to, uh, we, we can calculate the severity of the risk by using this uh, formula given in this EN927 part one. So th that is on selection of a protection for the applications. Uh, and the part two specifies the performance of the coating. Right? When we talk about the performance of the wood coating, uh, there are several concerns. Right? One is blistering. You know, there may be some bubbles can form after we apply the coating. So if, if it comes, that means uh, it, is a, it is a performance concern of the coating. Uh, so then the cracking, the coating can be cracked and then peel off, right? Uh, the flaking, then the addition, how much, what is the, uh, the, I mean the, 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 the capacity of the bonding of the coating to the wood. Uh, so these factors we have to consider in EN 927, it specifies the limits uh, for when, if the coating is in stable category, specifies these limits. If it is in semi-stable category, specifies other limits. If it is in non-stable non category, then uh, these are the limits. So uh, if, if we, I mean, we have to test the coating according to these things, and then we can come into a conclusion that in which category this coating will fall, right? Also, one other aspect is water, water absorption or the permeability, right? Uh, you know, I told that uh, the, in, in stable category, we cannot allow any dimensional uh, change, right? So uh, mainly uh, the dimensions of the dimensions of the wood will change due to humidity or the water. When water absorbs, because wood is a, you know, it's, it's from tree. So before we cut and dry, uh, there were uh, moisture and water inside the tree. So after we uh, dry it, then there are many uh, spaces inside porous area. So moisture and water will uh, go there. Uh, I mean, when it reacts with the cells of the wood, uh, the sizes of the cells will vary. So in some, I mean, it, it depends on the wood space here also. So. In local industry, if it is uh, mahogany, so it is with very high expansion ratio. Uh, so when we, I mean, when you study about the wood in, in EN350 in this book, which I mentioned, uh, you can have these figures. Uh, what is the expansion ratio and all, right? Uh, so anyway, I mean, if we are using any wood in the dimensionally stable category, we have to apply a port in which uh, seals the wood uh, uh, with not allowing moisture to enter into the wood, right? If we stop moisture coming into wood, we cannot con we can control the uh, the shrinkage and the expansion, the dimensional changes, right? Here it specifies that uh, uh, water absorption value. There is a test method that actually, I mean, uh, I think in EN nine two seven part five of uh, six, there is a test method. So you can study there how how we can test this thing. Uh, anyway, there are some limits mentioned in uh, part two. Uh, in stable category, it should not uh, be more than 175 grams per square meter. If, if the coating is in semi-stable category, then it should not go uh, beyond 250 grams per square meter. If it is in unstable category, there is no upper limit. Uh, the, actually, it says uh, the, the lower limit is mentioned because of the limits of the testing. I mean, if it is zero, that's fine. But uh, I think uh, according to the test method, uh, it's not possible to measure below uh, 30 grams per square meter. So that's why they have mentioned the uh, lower limit also, but uh, it should not go beyond the upper limit. So that is how uh, it specifies uh, in EN 927 part two. So this is uh, about EN 927. I'm not going, I mean, other, other parts specifies the test methods. So I don't want to uh, explain these things because uh, you can study and uh, I mean, you are into these things more than me. So uh, you can study those things. I, I, I have given you just the introduction of, of the code, especially the concerns uh, we should consider at the site. Uh, here I'll show you a test report 
uh, which we have taken for our products uh, complied to EN927. Uh, so here we have uh, tested several uh, samples. Uh, this is the sample classification. Uh, so here, these are the results of water absorption. You can see uh, the coating thickness and the uh, water absorption. Uh, here, it, they have measured the coating thickness of each sample. You can see here, I, I told you that uh, the built, uh, one classification is built. Uh, so you can see some coatings go up to 141 uh, micrometers thickness, right? Uh, some is very less, uh, I mean, some are very less, uh, say, 54, something like that, right? Uh, so water absorption also, you can see it varies. Uh, some are very less, like 98 or something like that. Some are very high, 260. So over over 175 means uh, it comes under, under uh, semi-stable category. Uh, if it is more than uh, 250 means this one, it is under non-stable category. If it is below 175, then we can categorize it as uh, a coating in uh, stable category, right? Uh, then uh, according to the uh, outdoor weathering, outdoor weathering, uh, this is the gloss change they have measured in six months uh, and uh, in 12 months also. Uh, then uh, color change, color change in uh, six months and 12 months. Then uh, bubble formation, you know, blistering and all, right? This is the testing after six months, after 12 months. Then, uh, uh, then flaking. Uh, then uh, cracking, right? There are some coatings cracked in 12 months, right? Uh, then uh, a mole growth, right? Likewise, uh, according to EN 927, there are some uh, test spots also mentioned in the 927. Uh, in addition to the, the criteria they have mentioned within the code, they have referred to some other test code also. Uh, so this is how it uh, measured and how the results are presented. Uh, so you can see after considering all these things, it classified the code in uh, for the each category. Some are, some are uh, recommend for limited dimensional stable category, some dimensional stable category, some non-stable category. Likewise, I mean, if you if you uh, consider a product to purchase for your application, for your site, then you can consider your application, then you can uh, ask for the test report from the supplier and you can select uh, according to these things, right? So this is uh, EN927. So we'll move on to AN713. I think now it becomes boring because I'm talking about codes and all, all this. Uh, so for me also, I mean, just talking. Anyway, I mean, I'll finish this thing with this slide. Uh, AN713, 713. It is about safety of toys. AN721 is, a, is about toys. But especially I'm talking about this thing because for some concerns, we should uh, consider this. Uh, especially if it is for kids' toys or something uh, touched by kids. Let's say a floor in, in the house, wooden floor, then kids may walk on that, kids may fall on that. So if kid, kids touches that space, then we have to consider this EN 71, uh, three, uh, I mean 71 part three concerns about migration of certain elephants. So coatings comes under this uh, part. So we have to test, I mean, in this, uh, this uh, code in 71.3 specifies limits for some, uh, some uh, chemicals or materials like aluminum, uh, antimony, arsenic, uh, barium, boron, uh, cadmium, chromium, uh, cobalt, copper, lead, 
manganese, mercury, nickel, selenium. Likewise, it specifies some chemicals and the upper limits, which uh, it is possible to be allowed to contain in the coating. So this is important basically for the uh, spaces where kids are in the concern. Uh, but I mean, I especially discuss these things with you because I found this uh, uh, code mentioned in some specifications in our main uh, BOQs, uh, I mean, uh, BSRs. Uh, for some applications for, I mean, you know, doors and windows in office like that. So they have asked uh, for the com compliance with the CN 713. So it is irrelevant, irrelevant actually, not important. I mean, if it is a wooden deco, if it is a wooden door and window, uh, then, uh, I mean, uh, safety of toys, I mean, no safety for the kids is not a concern. Uh, but uh, maybe because they are not aware on these things, they just meant and mentioned that uh, the product should be complied with EN 713. But actually, it should be mentioned as EN 927 because if it is an exterior application, we have to consider EN 927. So then you have to mention uh, the, the, uh, the, the category also. Let's say we, we have, you have to mention that this product should be comply, complied with. EN 927 for the dimensionally stable uh, applications. Likewise, we have to uh, give the specification. But I have seen uh, in such kind of uh, government uh, BOQs uh, mentioned that uh, the product should be complied with, with EN 713. That's why I put this uh, also here. Uh, so this also I can share if you need the, the I have the okay, I have all these codes, so I can share if you need. So that is the uh, that is the uh, things relevant to engineering codes. We should understand and we should follow. So basically, if I summarize, uh, we have to uh, consider the risk of the application, the risk of degradation due to the use class first. Then we have to consider the uh, the, the specifications of the uh, coating. Uh, with the application, so if 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 the if it is I mean uh, recommended for the uh, the category of, of the stability or other performance factors, water absorption, all those things we have to consider. Then the safety, health safety, especially when it comes to uh, uh, the concern of kids, right? Uh, so these are the things uh, I mean we have to refer. Uh, these are the engineering codes we have to refer when we talk about wood protection coatings. Uh, there are several others, but uh, I'm not going to talk about these things, especially test uh, methods and all are there. There are some other codes are there, but uh, those are not much relevant for the uh, wood coatings, wood protection coatings to be used at site. Right? So let's see what are the available solutions. So uh, we discussed about the engineering codes. Uh, but I mean, at the site, we have to work with available solutions. So basically, uh, when we consider the uh, degradation factors, uh, we have two main parts. We have to consider biological attacks and atmospheric attacks, as we have uh, discussed earlier. So for the biological attacks, you have to do a preservation. Right? For the atmospheric attacks, you have to apply it protection coating or protection system for uh, I mean, to resist uh, the relevant attack, right? Uh, so uh, for the human use, we, we can consider the factor affecting and we can give the resistance to that factor. Say if it is a flooring, scratch resistance is a requirement. So we have to use a application, I mean, coating uh, with which is scratch resistant up to the degree which we require. Uh, then if uh, should consider the heat, then we should have a heat resistant coating. Uh, if it is against chemicals or detergents, we have to have a coating with chemical resistance, which resists to the such chemical in that application. Then to vibrations, then for the repeating impacts, we should have a resistance. Uh, then, I mean, these are the things we have to consider and we have the, the solution, solutions we can find. So we'll discuss in detail. 
so for the biological attacks, I told you the preservation is very uh, important. Uh, why? Why is? Uh, I mean, preservation is against biological attacks. So it should resist with biological attacks. Definitely, a preservative or the preservation method only is a toxic method. So, I mean, it should be toxic to the biological creatures, maybe insects, may, maybe fungi or, or any, any other living creatures. So if it is tox toxic to them, it will be toxic to us also. So we should uh, pay more attention on this. Especially, we cannot apply a top coating or a surface coating with preservative parameters. We cannot include any preservative chemicals uh, on the surface coating because it is, on one hand, it is not recommended, on the other hand, it is not uh, good for our health. So, first, I mean, that is why the wood preservative is important because, uh, on the other hand, we cannot apply a preservation uh, or preservative after we apply the surface coating. So if we don't remove the surface coating again for a used plant, we cannot apply a preservative again. So it's very important at the, in, at the initial point, we have to uh, apply a wood preservative. Uh, I will uh, show you what are the techniques which we use for wood preservation, uh, but it is very important to have at the initial stage, right? Uh, uh, so, uh, the other thing is uh, why it is important is because there are some wood species uh, with natural durability. So it, it is durable against uh, biological, biological attacks also. But in the industry, in the current context, we cannot select wood. I mean, we cannot select the species. Even if we select the species, maybe it is not matured well. Uh, maybe we have to get it with sap wood. We cannot get the hard wood only. So, so there are some limitations. So then it becomes a preservative or the preservation treatment is a must, right? So when we select a good preservative coating at the site, uh, you have to consider the resistance to all possible biological attacks. Because uh, actually in Sri Lankan context, we don't give much importance for these preservatives. Normally, uh, I mean, even in the major construction site, they don't specify uh, preservatives special, right? Most of the time, um, if it is a major construction site, maybe they will treat the wood in a factory. So then it will be okay. Or otherwise, if wood is not treated against uh, biological attacks, then we have to apply a wood preservative at the site. Uh, so. I mean, in our specifications, it is not specified as I had as uh, my experience, especially when it comes to small scale constructions like houses or small buildings, and don't, they don't consider anything about these preservatives. They, they just use something they can find in the, in the market. But uh, most of the preservatives in the market will not resist to uh, most of the biological attacks, especially it is not resistant against termites. Uh, and the flying insects, right? Because of that, I mean, uh, after constructing within maybe six to 12 months, they will uh, get the experience of uh, biological attacks. So it is a very important concern uh, for, for us to specify a good wood preservative, which will resist to all possible biological attacks. The second important thing is deep penetration. Right? Preservative is a uh, uh, protection against biological attacks. It is not a uh, surface attack, right? Uh, I mean, the insects and all can attack from inside also. If they can enter from one side or in a, in a very small place, then they can attack inside also. So the uh, protection should be within inside. So the preservative coating should penetrate very deep into the wood. This penetration directly relates with the uh, level of protection gives, right? Then. Uh, other thing is uh, considering the aesthetic appearance and the, the final result, uh, there should be no changes to the wood surface or the grain color uh, and or the appearance, right? Uh, so the wood preservative should not give any, I mean, should not make any variations, any, many, any changes. Because we, I mean, uh, maybe you have seen that some oils or something uh, or uh, maybe some uh, 
uh, burnt oil or some some things uh, using in uh, some small scale sites. I mean, after we applied such a thing, if there may be some oily surface on the wood, or if there's a color change, then we can uh, have the finish what we need. Uh, then the other thing is compliance with health safety standards. Yes, uh, it is toxic, true, but uh, it should be uh, within the limits, right? Uh, so there are health safety standards. So we have to uh, comply with those also. So if all these factors are there, then it will be a good uh, wood preservative. Then, uh, what are the methods of wood preservation? Other than, I mean, in addition to the on site preservative application, there are some other techniques. Um, actually, I'm not an expert on all these things, but I'll, uh, I mean, I'll present you these things. You can uh, study more into these things later. Uh, so, dipping is one method. This, this is just dip uh, in a preservative container uh, for a few minutes, actually. It is not for days, just for a few minutes. We, we uh, dip, dip there and take it off. Uh, so, the, the idea is to penetrate more preservative into the wood. Then the second one is cold soaking. Uh, in that case, actually, we dip uh, the wood. Uh, in the preservative container for two to seven days actually. And it is not dipping actually called as soaking. Then with the time, it's a, normally we use a low viscosity uh, uh, oil bone preservative in this case. So then uh, the preservative will penetrate more into the wood and it will give a, a good resistance. Then the thermal process treatment, uh, this is not the thermal modification. This is thermal process preservative treatment. Uh, here we uh, uh, immerse wood into two separate tanks. One is with uh, heated preservatives, one is with cold preservatives. First, we put it into the heated preservative container, then take it off and put to the cold preservative uh, container. Then, uh, I mean, it will give a better treatment, a better protection than the soaking method also. Then there's one, one method called double diffusion. Here also we uh, use two containers, I mean two preservatives. First we put into one and then put into the two, second one. Then uh, it will give <clears throat> more protection, right? Then the other method is pressure impregnation. Here also in Sri Lanka we use this method. Uh, there are some factories uh, which we use this thing. Uh, we use uh, an airtight steel container. We put wood into that and we fill uh, the container with preservative chemicals. Then uh, we will uh, increase the pressure within the container. Then uh, with this pressure, uh, these preservatives will penetrate more into the wood. So that is pressure impregnation. Then there is uh, another, uh, actually it is not a chemical treatment. Uh, we call as thermally modified wood, thermal modification. Uh, you can find that thermo wood or something like that. There are some brands uh, uh, which they do this thing. Here, actually, they uh, uh, heat the wood into high temperatures, maybe sometimes up to 800 degrees. Right? Then, the, I mean, all the biological things will damage in, in easily. And, the, <clears throat> I mean, the cell structure of the wood also uh, will change. Because of this thing, uh, wood will, I mean, the, 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 the natural durability of the wood will improve maybe sometimes up to 20, 25 years. Then uh, we don't want any other uh, treatment, actually. We can use that wood for 20 to 25 years, uh, even with the atmos atmospheric attacks and all. Uh, so that is thermal modifications, not only for the preservation, but for the protection. In Sri Lanka also, uh, I think one or two factories are here do thermal modification for uh, rubber wood. Uh, so this is also one other uh, methodology, right? <clears throat> uh, then uh, on-site preservative application, which we can do, the, the one and only solution which we can do at the site. So this is wood preservation. I mean, uh, the resistance against biological attacks. Then we have wood protection solutions. Uh, with translucent wood coatings. You can see this image here. Uh, here we have applied the translucent coating uh, on the 
I mean, if the color is like a teak wood color. Uh, so you can see the wood also behind the coating. So we call this as translucent coating. So we have wood protection coatings uh, in translucent. So I mean, it is commonly used in uh, uh, Sri Lanka, even for the small projects, you know, uh, you may have heard that the word uh, water-based applications like that. It is something the word, uh, I mean, uh, bonded into the society uh, doing water base and all. Uh, so that is translucent uh, wood protection. Uh, so here in translucent coating, wood grain is visible. Uh, wood color or in other, or in clear or in other colors, you can get it. Uh, also in different builds, different coating thickness, uh, thicknesses, uh, different gross levels, or in different hiding capacities, you can uh, get the coatings. Uh, according to your specification. And uh, there are some coatings for interior and exterior also. If it is in interior, we have to uh, consider on uh, the health, safety and all, VOC levels and all. Uh, then for the exterior, we have to uh, think on the uh, atmospheric uh, or weathering uh, concerns. Uh, also in different categories, uh, water-based coatings are there, solon-based coatings are there, nitrocellulose coatings are there, some other categories also there. Uh, so, uh, there are some different technical categories there and uh, different application methods also. Uh, we can apply by uh, brush, so for some coatings by brush, some coatings by roll, uh, some for spray, by all spray or uh, with uh, air, or sponge, cloth, roller coaters. Uh, maybe you have uh, heard or you have studied on roller coaters also, because if it is a factory, we cannot apply these things by hand or spraying, it is difficult. So there are our roller coaters. Uh, then for the for different applications, we have to check with the product which we are selecting uh, for the suitability. Because some products we can uh, use it by brush or spray, but not in the roller coaters. Uh, for the products which we are using in roller coaters, we cannot use at the site. So likewise, we have to think on these parameters when we are selecting uh, the solution, right? Uh, and uh, we, uh, when you're talking about translucent wood protection, as engineers, we should uh, know some factors or parameters. Uh, one is UV resistance. So we should understand what is the degree of UV resistance used by that protection. You know, now you know uh, how to calculate the severity and how to, uh, how to identify the factors and all for the degradation. So if it is the application with high or severe UV attacks, then UV resistance is one of main concern. So here actually we can uh, get the details from the manufacturer uh, for the durability against UV uh, for the product, right? Then uh, if it is uh, exposed to rain, uh, then the application is uh, on vertical uh, inclination, then water repellent is, should be there. Uh, then uh, if required waterproof qualities also should be there. If it is uh, in a horizontal surface, uh, in a horizontal application, then waterproof properties should be there. Then microporous. Microporous is a parameter or a feature uh, which helps to uh, avoid cracking of wood. Actually, it's like this. I mean, uh, uh, a wood is a porous material, right? Uh, after we dried it, the water or the moisture will go away, but uh, air will uh, go into the wood and uh, the, all the uh, porous will be filled by air. Now we coat it using a wood protection coating or a paint or something, we, we cover it. Uh, then when the temperature goes high, the inside air uh, start to expand. Then a the pressure develops, right? If the coating is well bonded to the wood, there's no space for air to go out. So when this happens repeatedly, uh, the pressure need to be released, then the wood will be cracked to release the pressure. Or otherwise, if there are some joints or something, then joints will be uh, displaced or uh, expanded. Then from those areas which the pot is not applied, uh, this pressure will get released. So if a micro, if a pot in with microporous feature, uh, I mean, uh, through the pot in, air can flow, but moisture cannot move, right? Then moisture ca cannot come in, but 
air can uh, transfer through this coating. So there will be no pressure develops uh, within the wood. So the cracks and all will not be occur. Right? This is the microporous microporous feature. Normally, uh, not all the uh, coatings have this uh, feature. Uh, especially if it is a varnish or uh, if it is a epoxy or something, uh, then this microporous feature will not be there. Uh, so if it is an exterior application, we should have a coating, especially with microporous feature, or otherwise uh, would get damaged with the heat and all. Uh, we call this, we call this as actually uh, we allow in wood to breathe. Right? Uh, then the build. Uh, or the dry coating thickness. This is also a concern, especially when it is exterior. So if it is with the less uh, dry coating thickness, uh, then uh, maybe it's not uh, resistant to weather. Well, it depends on, I mean, you can see the test reports also, but uh, when you are selecting a product, build is one concern because when you take the coating, when you open the container, when you open the can, we can see some coatings are very thin, like water. Some coatings are very uh, uh, thick, or high viscosity, just like a cream. So when you take these two examples, the thin one will give a very thin dry coating thickness. So the, the protection against uh, weathering and also will be less normally. That is the practice. Right? Then uh, the maintenance procedure and time. Right? That also a concern because in some cases, maintenance is uh, a very uh, difficult or even maintenance of a wood coating is very expensive. Uh, so maintenance time and procedure also. For some uh, products like nitrocellulose uh, coatings and all, we have to remove the whole coating, varnishes also. We have to remove the full coating to do the maintenance. We have to remove the existing coating and we have to apply a new coating. That is how it maintain. But uh, for some other wood protection coatings, uh, we have like stains and all, we can just clean and apply it. So the maintenance will be very less. Uh, also, regarding the time, some coatings we have to maintain in every six months. For some coating, it goes up to 12 years. Right? Depends on the application because sometimes we have to avoid uh, the regular maintenance in six months. There are applications. Uh, like, I mean, uh, when we are going to talk about oils, you will understand. Uh, for the decks and all, uh, decking oils normally uh, have to maintain it six months time right but because of the difficulty of maintenance normally people move on to uh, other products like decking stains which will give a more durability but the protection is less so there are some concerns like that uh, and the coating system durability against color fading in sri lanka it's uh, uh, one main concern because due to uh, uv rays of the sunlight uh, color of the coating will get faded uh, very quickly. Uh, so we have to consider the durability of that. Then cracking, peeling, blistering, and all these things. So basically, if the if we have the certifi certification uh, for the product against EN 927, all these things uh, are in, are considered. So we can have have an just idea about the. Uh, durability of these things if it is complied to EN927 and we have to see in which category. Right, this is about translucent wood coating. Uh, so then we will move on to the opaque wood coating. So opaque means actually opaque coatings uh, hides uh, uh, the total wood surface. It shows only the color. Um, I think you have seen these things, uh, especially in kids furniture. Uh, we use these things, but in Europe and all, not only kids' furniture for the houses and all, you can see this red color there. Maybe windows they use doors and windows in white color and all. Uh, so they mainly use opaque colors. But in, but in Sri Lanka, uh, we don't use that much of opaque colors. Mainly we use translucent colors. But uh, opaque opaque uh, wood coatings gives more durability for the wood uh, than translucent. Sometimes up to 12 years. Uh, in our range, we have coatings up to 12 years. So uh, from a translucent coating, we cannot get that, that uh, much of durability. Uh, here, actually, wood grain is hydered. Uh, it's high weather resistant. Uh, 
with many different colors. You can have thousands of colors here and uh, in different bills and gloss, gloss levels, in different thicknesses and in matte, in uh, semi-gloss, in high gloss likewise. Uh, then different use classes. We have, I mean, there are products uh, in the market for interiors applications as well as exterior also. Uh, then different categories, water-based coatings are there, solar-based coatings are there, like a shell -like likewise. Uh, there are different categories. Uh, the applications also, as in, uh, in, in previous transfers and coatings, there are uh, different application methods also. So this is opaque wood protection. Then there are some other products called oils, right? Oil is a product. It is not just a, I mean, uh, just a cooking oil or something like that. Uh, it, it, it is also a coating. It is also a paint or, or a wood protection coating, but uh, with, I mean, with the uh, base material of a uh, wood oil, like a teak oil or bunkery oil or something, uh, a wood oil is, a, is the base. So the, 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 the main parameter is, main concern is, this wood, wood oil will uh, penetrate well into the wood porous and uh, I mean, gives uh, uh, I mean the health, healthy uh, internal environment for the wood. Then the scratching, the cracking of the wood, all these things will get reduced. And also one main concern is, especially the, for the horizontal surfaces, with the possibility of scratching. Let's take a wooden deck, right? A wooden deck or a pool deck. Normally, it's a horizontal surface. We work on this, uh, we work with shoes, uh, maybe some uh, sand or uh, dirty will be there. So if there are sand particles, when we work on that sand par particle, then uh, uh, the, the coating will get uh, damaged, scratched very easily. There may be furniture or buggies maybe moving on that uh, day. Then it is, I mean, it is possible and it is very easy to damage the surface coating, right? If even if we use a very good waterproof uh, surface coating, after we uh, damage it, it's a, I mean, a very small scratch is sufficient, right? Then if a water droplet uh, comes there, water will get penetrated very slowly into the wood, and the inner uh, the water will be there and the uh, wood get uh, damaged right uh, if you if you get a chance uh, to uh, get a, a wood piece from a wooden deck used for let's say 3 4 years without oil treatment you can cut it and see this, uh, the the cross section you will see the surface is very hard but the inside is very uh, soft you can uh, you can damage it even by your deck, right even, even by your finger right? because uh, i mean uh, with the water the inside could soften. Uh, the main damage for the deck in a wood is this reason. Uh, I mean, the surface will be uh, will be there. I mean, with, with very healthy, but the inside will get soft. So this is a main concern because uh, a surface coating will not uh, work on this with the scratch. For these kind of applications, we have to apply oil. Then oil get penetrates into the wood, even if the surface would damage, uh, the a thick layer uh, is saturated with the oil. So now water cannot go inside. So this is the one and only solution for the decks or a garden furniture sometimes. Right? Uh, oil is a must. So oil is such a product uh, which penetrates deep into the wood and saturate the wood uh, for us uh, inside the wood. Right. So this is the uh, this is a uh, oil. Uh, so normally now oils come uh, also with UV resistance uh, and in many different colors, uh, in many wood colors or, or other colors. Uh, in uh, different, uh, actually uh, this is something copied from the previous slide. It's not in different wheels, uh, not in uh, uh, different gross levels. It normally comes in uh, uh, matte, uh, just a very thin coat in surface, but penetrated into the wood. So not in different wheels. Uh, for different uh, use classes, oils comes because for interior we use uh, for furniture also sometimes. Uh, especially oils comes for exterior uh, in different categories. So it's also come in water-based uh, and solvent-based categories, right? Mm, so that is about oil. 
Then the other category is varnishes. Normally, we find varnishes as uh, hard coatings, hard wearing uh, resistance to uh, many uh, human uses. Right? Uh, here you saw a picture of a wooden flooring because uh, uh, varnish is a hard wearing coating. The floor and the furniture sometimes need a hard wearing uh, surface. The floor normally we walk always. Then uh, I mean there may be some furniture moving there. So scratching is very uh, common and very easy. So hard wearing surface should be there for those kind of applications. The varnish is a must. But in Sri Lankan industry, actually, there are some uh, uh, dislikes for varnishes because in early stages, uh, some people used uh, varnishes in exterior applications uh, and got many uh, defects and all. So bad experience. So now in, in the Sri Lankan market, actually, uh, most people don't like varnishes. But in some cases, varnish is the only one solution, especially for this interior flooring and all. Uh, but you have to uh, remember that varnishes don't uh, have microporous uh, feature. So when we use the varnish in exterior context, we have to uh, be careful because if we cover all the six uh, sides of the wood uh, using a the varnish, then wood will get cracked very easily with the time with the, with the temporary change. Right. So we have to take care of that. But anyway, we have varnishes for interior, varnishes for exterior as well. Uh, and in different categories, varnishes also in water-based technology and in solar-based technology also. So varnishes come in different builds and different gross levels, uh, in matte, semi-gross, high-gross likewise. Uh, so this is uh, about varnishes. So the, those are the main categories which we can find uh, wood protection coatings. Uh, so we we have to select this technical category also according to our applications. Right? Then there are some common concerns in selecting a wood coating. Uh, right. Uh, one is VOC level, especially. Uh, relevant to some projects like if you are, go, if you are have, doing a project in a resort or something like that, uh, then they, they have a, a very, uh, I mean, significant concern on VOC level. VOC means volatile organic content. That means uh, if we take a coating, there are, I mean, there, I mean, normally in a coating, there are many, there are many two, two parts. One is the chemicals uh, to get the performance, say color or something like that. And the other is the base, right? Base is always uh, evaporated uh, within the curing period. But uh, with that, there may be some chemicals, volatile organic contents are there, which will evaporate and mix with the uh, normal surrounding. So that's why if the VOC level is higher, we will get a <coughs> hard smell. You, you may have, have the experience uh, in some coatings, some paints, when we apply it, there is a hard smell. Uh, sometimes uh, it is uh, very hard to stay in that space. For some uh, paints and coatings, there is no smell at all, right? So this is due to the different VOC levels. Actually, there are limits uh, in Europe also. I, I don't know, know in Sri Lanka, but in Europe, there are some limits uh, which we can have the uh, maximum level of the VOC uh, for, for such coating. Uh, according to the application. If it is interior, it's very less. If it is exterior, we can have some uh, higher value. Uh, so VOC level is a concern. Then the drying time is a concern. Because uh, in some cases, we need fast drying. In some cases, we purposely need slow drying. Uh, let's say we are applying the wood, uh, wood oil or something which need to be penetrated deep. So if it dries uh, fast, uh, it has no time to penetrate more into the wood. So if we use uh, uh, coating for a deck or something like that, uh, oil or something uh, which needs penetration, definitely we have to use a slow drying uh, coating. Uh, but say we are using uh, a coating for doors and windows at a site with uh, more dust and all, so we cannot have a slow drying one there because uh, if 
when it gets get uh, delays to dry, dust and all will uh, uh, deposit on the smoothing surface and the finish will get damaged. So definitely we need a quick drying one. Normally, uh, if if it is a water-based coating, it will start to uh, dry within 15 minutes. Uh, so there are there are products dries in 15 minutes, maybe up to two hours like that. Uh, or other hand, slow drying coatings uh, are there, drying up to 12 to 24 hours also. Right? So we have to select the product according to the drying time which we need. Then the application procedure. As I uh, shown you earlier, some products we can apply by brush or sprayer or uh, roller. Uh, likewise, there are different application methods uh, and procedures also. So we have to identify the application method and procedure because our application may need a special application method. Say you are working in a uh, factory using roller quarters, then you have to select products which can be used with roller coaters only. Or some products are there we can uh, uh, use by spray. Especially when it comes to decking and all which the, the penetration is required, we have to apply by brush only. We cannot use a roller because it will not give much uh, paint volume there. Uh, we need a brush only, right? Then uh, the maintenance procedure and intervals, commonly we have to consider what is the maintenance procedure? Some, as I told you, some products we have to remove the previous coating. Some products we have just to sand it and apply. Some products uh, we just want to wash it and apply. Uh, right? I mean, uh, these are the things we have to commonly consider. So, these are the things I have to share with you. Uh, uh, the knowledge um, uh, regarding this wood protection. I mean, this is not the uh, the, I mean, the, not the whole, just a very small uh, introduction. So I think now you, you have an idea uh, that on which parts we have to study further on this food protection. And uh, I have to uh, bring into your attention about some myths in the local industry also, because when you are going to the industry, uh, you will have to work with, work with these myths also. Uh, but before that, I, I, I will explain you because in Sri Lankan market, especially uh, the word water based, or in singular, they call as water based, right? Uh, it is a word, I mean, uh, heavily uh, sticked into the society uh, with regards to this uh, wood coatings, right? Uh, they talk about uh, water based coatings, they, they talk about water based finish. They talk about application procedure for water base. Uh, so likewise, there are some concerns and myths. So let's uh, understand what is water based and what is solar based. So as I told you earlier, if we take a coating or a paint or a, a wood protection, there are two main uh, components. One is the chemical, uh, the chemicals which use for the uh, performance. I mean, uh, to get the color, we have colorants. Uh, to get the UV resistant, we have UV, UV absorbers. Uh, for To get the water repellent and waterproof qualities, uh, to get the uh, scratch resistant and all, there are some chemicals, right? Those chemicals we add to get the perform performance from the coating which we expect. Then there's a base or a medium which we use to dilute this thing uh, to make it as a coating which we can apply by a brush or spray like that to apply on a wood. So this is the base, right? Uh, earlier, I mean, uh, before uh, 70, 80 years ago, I mean, uh, in the early stages of uh, uh, 1900s, uh, they used solvents or petroleum byproducts as the base. So we call them as solvent-based coatings. But later when it comes to, uh, I mean, uh, when, uh, when after the World Wars and all, Europe uh, had problems with getting uh, this uh, petroleum oils and the byproducts. So they were looking for uh, some uh, uh, alternatives for these solvents. So later they found that, especially in the uh, 70s and 80s after this time, uh, they found that they can uh, use the water, H2O, as the base. They can uh, dilute those chemicals with the with some other 
chemicals and all they can dilute this thing in water so then water we call these products as water based if the base is water then it is a water based product if the base is uh, solvent then it is a solvent based product right that's the, this is the basic difference then what are the things uh, the, the differences between these uh, two water based products always dries very uh, fast uh, normally short time dry time uh, from 15 minutes to 3 hours like that uh, it will dry very quickly solvent based products normally takes uh, more than water based products sometimes up to 24 hours right uh, so that is the basic and main difference between water based and solvent based products uh, then uh, because of uh, water based products are dry fast Uh, when we apply by brush there is a tendency to have brush marks if uh, the application is by a hard brush so you know without any proper expertise then there may be some brush marks but uh, for solvent based it is very easy in application no brush marks will be there uh, because of the longer drying uh, drying period then uh, normally water based coatings are with low voc levels solvent based products are Uh, with higher voc levels than water based uh, because of the same thing water based products are with uh, less sodium uh, solvent based products are having some some higher odor than water based uh, water based products actually when we, after we apply we can uh, clean tools by water for the solvent based products we need uh, white spirit or thinner or turbine you know something like that right this is the main difference between water based and solvent based so there are some myths in the local industry that regarding the uh, uh, water based or water based word uh, people uh, use this word to mention uh, some product or some i mean just a brand sometimes right on the other hand they use that word to uh, mention uh, uh, application procedure with uh, different uh, coatings right uh then they use that word to uh, identify or specify a finish a translucent wood coating finish they call it as water based finish right likewise there are some different uh, role uh, interpretations of this word also and also uh, there are some myth that water based coatings are more healthy it's true that water based coatings are with low voc levels but it doesn't mean that uh, it is healthy Uh, i'll give you an example like this uh, let's think that i have two glasses of uh, uh, two glasses one is with water one is with uh, petroleum byproducts such as thin right so if i ask you what is the healthiest one then you will say this what water is the healthiest health, healthiest one right because water we can drink thin we cannot drink so it is healthy anyway but now i let Uh, two drops of cyanide uh, to both right now which one is the uh, which one is healthy nothing both the not healthy no not safe to us so we have to consider more on not on the base but other chemicals includes in the coating uh, considering the health factors right maybe you have seen some some uh, wood coatings brands they are mentioning on their display boards that they don't uh, I have uh, lead now they don't have mercury now in their coatings that means th- those were there before they are publishing that no? that's why they are now they are mentioning that it is not there now so earlier it was there so those chemicals are much much uh, a danger for our health uh, than the base water or the solvent right so we have to consider the chemicals inside the coating not the base right base is harmless uh compare into the chemicals in the coating so for this uh, to check whether it's healthy or not we have to get the material safety data and the uh, the details of the product from the supplier or the test certificates uh, to check these things en713 specifies one concern of this thing there are some other codes also specifying the healthy uh, the health factors right so it is it is a myth that if we say water based products are uh, healthy in a common right then uh, the other myth is uh, in outdoors we, i mean if you need a good protection we have to use a water based products there's no uh, meaning of that actually uh, 
water based or solvent based both products differs uh, by the base this base will evaporate uh, 99 to 100% actually uh, within the curing time so that only the chemical will retain on the uh, wood surface so if the chemical is good it will give a more durable protection if it this chemical will not uh, up to that standard it will not give that durability not the base so there is no uh, concern on the base regarding the durability uh, so uh, again i mean when when i am doing these trainings and all for especially for the painters and all they are asking uh, i mean you are telling water based and solvent based are common or same uh, there is nothing in advantage for water based but uh, in sri lanka uh, we are getting lot of water based products in the market so if if solvent based are also good why we are not using it it's because of some uh, marketing uh, uh, skills of one brand actually but uh, comparing in the global market it is uh, solvent based uh, selling uh, more than water based so this these are the myths and all so this is the presentation i prepared for you and i think i, I was able to uh, convey some uh, some information a brief at least uh, which will enable you to uh, start your study on this wood protection part so if there are any questions uh, especially in practical concerns and all uh, all are welcome i'm ready to uh, uh, clarify you anything if there are. Thank you very much for your very interesting and informative lecture. And now uh, the, you can ask questions. Also, you can uh, post your questions into the chat box if you have any issues with your mic or your connection you can use that yeah i mean uh, it is easy for us to talk about these theories and everything so but uh, my experience uh, when you go to sites especially you will need some uh, practical knowledge yeah. so today actually we don't have a chance to show you the things and uh, show the applications and all because it will take much time and it, it needs a you know practical session so if uh, you have any questions on that then uh, i think it will be benefited to you as students i think sure. while they are preparing for the questions uh, i have some uh, things to clarify no not yeah. clarify actually the you mentioned that number of standards Sub, I don't uh, think we can download those standards. Simply uh, Yeah, actually, most of uh, the standards we have bought uh, uh -huh. by paying. I mean, if you need for the academic purposes, person purposes, I can share. Okay, okay. Thank you very I will, much. I will give you those things. Yeah, and other thing, uh, you was a lecture the slides. Can you share with us so that Maybe. I can upload it for the students? Okay, definitely. I'll share with you. Yeah. And uh, so, in your discussion, I saw that uh, the would uh, four things could the standards categorize as maybe stable, non non stable, and semi stable. And then they uh, in that uh, categorization consider about the environmental factors or atmospheric factors. Yes. Uh, then uh, according to the I, I feel that according to the biological factors that means they are uh, the wood type species. Mm -hmm. The yes. this build or coating thickness may be varies indeed. Yeah, actually these are different uh, concerns relates to. The same i mean uh, the, uh, the 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 categories classifications like stable unstable or semi-stable mm. uh, we consider that uh, i mean uh, according to the application right okay. it is not that to the uh, not not about the durability at all okay. just i mean first we identify the application let's say 
if it is a door, yeah. so we take it as a dimensionally stable uh, category. Mm. So then we have to find the coating which complied mm. with that. Uh, after say, when we select the protein, then we have to consider on the other things. I mean, biological attacks are out because bio biological attacks we have to treat separately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is uh, difficult, no? Not for, for a surface coating, we cannot include any preservatives. No? Mm -hmm. It is toxic. So mm -hmm. we have to do the preservative part separately. Maybe mm -hmm. in the factory or maybe in the site, we have to do the, do the preservative separately. Mm -hmm. So for the protection part, we consider atmospheric impacts mainly. Mm -hmm. uh, and for the performance factors, we have to consider this uh, dimensional stability and all. We have to consider those are some other parameters. That means according to that the standard, it is irrespective of the type of uh, wood species, no? Yes, irrespective. Actually, it is about the wood coating. Uh, EN 927 is uh, about paints and varnishes for exterior use, coatings and coating systems in exterior use. That, that's how it uh, mentioned. That means uh, maybe a coating or a coating system. Coating system means actually we can have two coats of the same product. Or we can have two products and first we have apply one product and then we can apply one product. Likewise, there's, there may be a coating system. Mm -hmm. So it, it tests maybe a coating or maybe coating system actually it test uh, the applied one i mean uh, on the test we prepare wood, wood pieces uh, by applying our wood coating and then we test it so that is how uh, it mentioned so ea 927 is for exterior wood coating sector not the wood species uh, just for the wood coating okay and uh... If you have questions, you can ask while we are talking. Then, uh, I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, are you welcome even in single that you can ask? So we'll explain it. Please yeah. ask. Uh, even it, 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 I think this is uh, the best time for you to get all the things clarifies and try. Please ask even in Sinhala. Sinhala, come back now and use this opportunity. Actually, for last uh, four to five years, I worked in this uh, sector. Uh, in mm -hmm. Sri Lanka and Maldives both. So, uh, I mean, there are many practical concerns. Sometimes it is, I mean, I mean, uh, the EN codes and all, it's just we can study and learn. Mm -hmm. But uh, for some practical concerns, because wood is a material uh, with many differences. Let's take mm -hmm. uh, a teak wood. So we can have many differences uh, in Various. each example. Even from the same tree, mm -hmm. if we get two samples, it is different. Mm -hmm. So practical concerns, sometimes uh, more than this, the EN standards and all, when we apply a wood coating, sometimes it will not show us the same performance what we expect. So many things are there. So, I mean, with the practical experience, we gain a lot. I mean, sometimes we don't, we cannot get these things from the books. So I like if you can ask even, don't think, I mean, sometimes uh, people think, um, whether it's to ask or not, because maybe, maybe it's not a good, not a good yeah. question or something like that. But you can ask. I mean, you can share the knowledge, no? Yeah, of course. Please ask. I highly recommend you all to ask at least one question. If you were actually there, please ask. <laughs> <laughs> that is the most of the time, the problem with the online classes. Yeah. The yeah, physical yeah. class, we can see some interaction. Yes, some more interaction yes. than this online spaces. Anyway, please ask now. You they are in semester five. So after this semester, the the industrial training placement has to be done. Mm -hmm. So this is a good opportunity. Please ask questions. And uh, I uh, I also heard lot lot about this water based uh, paintings. Mm -hmm. The the solvent based painting, what kind of solvent you usually use? Uh, actually, all uh, uh, from uh, petroleum byproducts. Mm -hmm. 
the thing is uh, that here actually a concern that if it is a solon based product we have to mix with the thin or something and apply like that mm. uh, but the, the actual concern is not like that even a water based or even a solon based products these are two different products we don't want to dilute dilution is a concern of the product i mean if it is required we can dilute mm -hmm. otherwise no, no i mean uh, we, we can uh, apply as it is as it is right yes. actually we have uh, same product mm -hmm. that's why i told you i mean if it is a water based or if it is a solvent based if the chemical is same mm -hmm. only the base is different mm -hmm. we have to expect the same final result so wow. we in our range actually we have same product in solvent based and in water based so by looking at the coating we cannot see any difference mm -hmm. uh, as it is used in uh, europe the voc levels are also very low Mm -hmm. So there's uh, no difference in odor also. Uh, it is almost similar, but uh, drying time is different. So that is the main concern. So the solvent one drying time is very fast. High. No, no, it it is it is uh, de delayed. I mean, it takes ah, maybe uh, sometimes up to twenty four hours. Mm -hmm. uh, at minimum, it is three to four hours. It takes for the touch dry. Uh, for the water based things, it, it starts drying uh, from fifteen minutes. Mm -hmm. Some sometimes, uh, I mean, more than when we apply, it gets rise. So, then, then price, the cost of price is actually a solvent based are a little higher than water based products. Mm -hmm. uh, water based are cheaper now. Mm -hmm. But in our uh, local industry, actually, uh, what we heard is uh, water based are very expensive like that because that product, I mean, the one specific product, it is an expensive one. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have uh, a similar solon based one in the range. So people had no solon based product to compare with. Mm -hmm. Because of that, we get some myths like that the water based products are expensive, water based products are uh, good for exterior applications, uh, good for health. Everything uh, came because of there's no such similar product in solon mm -hmm. to compare with it. But now in our range actually we have. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, if it is an exterior application, we recommend a solvent based product because uh, it takes a lot of time to dry. It has sufficient time to penetrate also. Then, mm -hmm. then uh, good penetration, good bonding with everything uh, for exterior things, solvent based products are better. But mm -hmm. uh, in local industry, actually, still uh, the demand is for water based products. Okay. It's also water based products we use. Then if we if we take the solvent based uh, products, the how many type of solvent based? I, mean, I I think according to the the the, the task loose and the color. Yeah, and I mean, any, in addition to that. Uh, actually, for any product we can get in solvent and uh, water. I mean, if it is oil, we have in solvent and water. Okay. If it is a varnish, we have uh, products in solvent. We have products in water based also. Likewise, for any product, uh, actually most of the products now uh, in both bases. Uh, so it is just uh, the technology. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know how to clarify, it, but I mean, like, for any 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 category, stay and so uh, let's say varnishes, oils, uh, uh, any opaque products. All these products have. I mean, we can find in water based also and in solvent based so also. Yeah, yeah. It is just the base uh, and the formula which develops uh, to enable in dilute in water and solar. Maybe, mm. maybe the formula may be different, but we have both. Okay. If you don't have the questions. Uh... Yeah, I mean, if there's anything you can uh, share later. Then I can answer. Actually, okay. I, I like uh, to share the knowledge because in the, in the, in the industry, yeah. um, the engineers don't have, even myself, uh, didn't learn anything in the university regarding that food protection. So we learned uh, later in the industry, actually. So because of that, I saw, especially when uh, wood protection or paint selection, uh, there's no proper specifications in the BOK. Mm -hmm. Just uh, mention in some product uh, and uh, to level equivalent to that or something like that, but no proper specifications. The first thing. 
second thing is uh, engineers don't have a knowledge on the products and the technology so they just based on the details of a sales person from a company or a supplier so when i mean as suppliers when we tell this is the best one then they buy it they don't have a proper knowledge on uh, asking even about the technical details mm-hmm. even they don't ask uh, to which uh, en course this is complete so there is no such knowledge mm-hmm. so i i believe that knowledge should be transferred to the engineers and uh, then the i mean the the industry standards will go up you know improve i also uh, think so the, the small projects uh, most of the time the the client uh, based on the carpenter suggestions yes. <laughs> recommendations yeah even i mean even engineer engineers opinions are neglected yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the carpenters opinions are neglected yeah. yeah. so, and uh, one more thing comes to my mind now i forget it do you have any questions the uh, student please hurry up so we have to stop the session at 10 o'clock you we have two minutes more then all the singh himla tahana kiran thing eva nidara dore deka pewa tetini even though you do not have such big experiences the one thing i have observed some water based uh, product the sometimes when it interact with the water i can see some dye on the the, dye, the water what is colored with some kind of dye uh, uh, it is actually uh, because of a, of the failure of the product actually maybe sometimes in some products mm-hmm. uh, they uh, use dye coat first and then us to coat in again Uh, uh-huh. this dye, dye coating actually it is not uh, i mean it is just a just a dye just a uh-huh. color uh-huh. Uh, sometimes it is soluble in water uh, so it is uh, actually a failure of the defect of a, of the product not because of uh, not because it's a water based okay. product yeah because uh, even water based or solvent based the base will evaporate 100% mm-hmm. uh, when it is uh, curing so mm-hmm. only the chemicals are there the chemicals are not bonded well to the wood then it will be soluble in, in water or yeah. some other uh, normally uh, uh, even a water based or even a solvent based it should not should not be soluble in water after dry mm. it is a quality defect of the product actually mm. uh, I, i think as they use a top coat they don't consider on this thing because after it is covered then no problem i think yes. okay thank you very much uh, ajit for for your valuable giving you a valuable time so if you have uh, questions uh, you can post in the moodle and i can share with uh, ajit in future anyway i i think this is the best time this is we can uh, discuss but uh, as you do, do not have any questions uh, we will wind up the session thank you very much for your attention and uh, thank you very much adit for joining with us in future also we would like to take your uh, the support okay thank you very much thanks thank for having me here okay thank Bye. you thank you sir thank you sir